Let's get straight into our paper review segment. I've been joined this morning by three guests I'll introduce to you shortly. But the front page stories this morning, the Daily Guide reports that Takradi Missing Girl Saga, Kidnapper's Confession to BNI, Buzia Family Grateful to Akufuado, NDC decries Ghana card again, and Nana towards nothing reachings, Mahama exposed over Cuban doctors. The Daily Graphic, consumers to lose talk time value, Telcom's chamber, uh, irregularities in school feeding program, uh, according to the Auditor General's report, and car power ship shuts down temporarily, set sail to second D. The, um, the final newspaper says, Varsity, 42 SHSs for, from Saudi King to northern part of Ghana, Dr. Bomia, creates special desk for female soldiers. Mrs. Osei Opari appeals to the Ghana Armed Forces. She is our Chief of Staff. Uh, CBOD uh, moves to help uh, reduce fuel prices. And Anton Petition's president demands removal of Zusao Lana. Ghana, Angola open new chapter for deepened cooperation. The BNFT creates stability fund to finance future banking reforms that the CIB. And we, we back government's decision to investigate PDS deal. Danwell Insurance says so. Finally, the Ghanaian Times this morning, efforts to unravel mystery surrounding three kidnapped girls. Uh, DNA team arrives in Takradi tomorrow to obtain samples from relatives for analysis. Stories on page 17. Car power ship to be transported to Western Region on Thursday. Deputy Minister chastises MDCs for uh, late poor attendance at program. And uh, that's where you have it. My guest this morning, Nana Damwa, he speaks for uh, government, basically from the Energy uh, Ministry's point of view. Nana, welcome. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm very well. Ed Magbana well. is uh, the youth organizer of the ruling NDC. NDC, deputy youth organizer of the NDC. He also speaks for the NDC. Ed, good morning. How are you doing? Great. Good to be here. And I've been joined by a professor from the Canadian Universities of Ghanaian origin, by the way, Professor David Ferrang of Trent University. He has interest in social policy, uh, diversity management, international migration, and uh, transnationalism and child welfare. It's from the Petersburg uh, University in Ontario. Chief, good morning. Prof. Good morning. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Good, good, to, you? good to have you around here, sir. Let's begin. Nana, car power ship uh, yes. and matters arising. What do we need to know quickly? Thank you very much. Um, it's a great day for Ghana. Finally, we've been able to uh, put all in place all the necessary preparations to ensure that we can do this move. Mm. Um, it's been quite tedious, but we are grateful to God that it has happened. Now, this move is going to basically bring about two major things. Mm. The first thing is that we are going to have some element of great stability or greater great stability in the western part of the country. Mm. And that's an improved uh, mechanism for all of us. Secondly, um, it's going to help reduce the costs okay. of the money that uh, it co the, uh, the money that it costs us to you know, produce electricity from the car power ship. Mm. This is basically very simple. When you do a reverse gas flow from the Western Power Enclave mm. to the Tema Enclave, there is a cost because the pipeline doesn't belong to us. And it belongs to the West Africa Gas Pipeline. And there is a charge that we have to pay for transporting gas through the, the, the system. Mm. Again, we can only transport limited volumes because, because the pipeline belongs to West Africa Gas Pipeline. They have already contracted volumes that okay. they flow through it. Okay. So it's only the excess in that um, mm. pipeline, which they, their contracted volumes do not reach, that we are allowed to flow. But as we are doing this relocation, we will no longer have to flow gas in the reverse direction to power the car power ship. Mm. And so that cost of transportation is removed, which will help reduce the cost of electricity production from the car power ship. Remember okay. that that is 450 megawatts mm. of, of electricity. So it is a, quite a very significant well, When are we expected to feel the impact of this transportation and uh, rerouting? Um, so what will happen is that it will take about three days for the ship to get to Takradi. Mm. And then after that, it will take about a further 17, 18 days to do all the interconnections and the necessary test things among others before it comes on stream fully. So I would say, if you leave me alone, I would say that let's give it one more month okay. to you know allow the engineers to do whatever it is that they have to do. We've waited about over over five years for this mm. thing to happen. So one more month shouldn't be too much of a difficulty. Mm. And then after that, we would come out. How, how does this uh, translate into, or if you like, compare with the increase in tariffs? Will anything change? Um, I, I do not speak for PURC. You, <laughs> might, you might want to take but, but that. But you mentioned that this would give us lower costs 
lower cost of generation. Power. Lower cost of generation for car powership. Okay. Remember, we have a myriad right. of other exactly. other uh, mm. generating plants. So for the car powership, we've made we've made some savings there. But like I have said, um, I do not speak for PRC. Let's but see but if if we're making savings at one point, it will trickle down to other points. And, um, uh, the, that that the, conversation has not been had yet. It it has been had, mm. but I do not want to be the one. To, to take the lead. Oh, but in, if you don't in, tell us. No, I will not. It, it's improper for me to do that, as you are aware. So I, I will not take the lead I hear in, you. In, in that. I hear you. Adam, this is good news, is it not? Well, uh, good morning to you once again, and good morning to our cherished viewers. Um, yesterday was the International Youth Day, so permit me to mention it and celebrate all the young people who are doing amazing things in Ghana. Uh, yesterday's theme for the celebration centered on inclusive education, which is uh, the SDG 4. And I think that talking about inclusive education, all of us must join hands and collectively <coughs> demand that all governments uh, make commitment to ensuring that no child is left behind in mm. terms of education. And when you're talking about that, there are a number of things that are very critical, especially rural mm. education for as, um, for some of us as education advocates mm. and, and, and social activists, we think that education in Ghana may be seeing some improvement in general, but when you go to our rural areas, mm. um, our, our kids, our younger brothers and sisters mm. are being left behind. If you observe over time the performance of our younger brothers and, and sisters in the basic education certificate examination, you realize that in some rural districts in Ghana, the even score as low as 0%, which means that you may be recording mm. some progress in education, but rural education is not seeing the, the needed growth. So the NDC shares the position that when you want to talk about inclusive education and you want to meet the targets in SDG4, it is important for us to place some emphasis on okay. rural education. Now, moving Great. to the car powership, I think that for us as citizens, um, our ultimate demand is that mm. we have affordable electricity and we have stable power mm. so uh, as to where a certain power plant is sited is not really a matter of priority if we have been told that when car power ship moved to takradi mm. the cost of production for car power ship will reduce and then we'll have some more stability mm. in terms of uh, the provision of electricity then i think that it's a good move uh, we only hope that this does not add up to one of the many things that we, we we are told and then yet when it comes to execution or implementation we don't mm -hmm. see it i think that it will take us some time to you really observe doubts. whether or not um, yes i i do have doubt but but i will give the ministry of energy uh, the power ministry some benefits of the doubt mm -hmm. because in the past we 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 have had many other pronouncements on on some major moves within the energy ministry mm -hmm. and then we are told oh this is the end to power crisis there will be no power cuts and all of that but we are still experiencing this and what is even more painful is the fact that government is we even unable to admit oh, yes yes we still experience power cuts i'm sure when you ask your viewers today to keep sending you messages from their various locations. We do. Even yesterday, that was a holiday. I spent all my time at home. I live at Ajingano. Residents in that area can confirm. For about 35 to 40 minutes, we experienced power cuts. So all we are demanding is stability in power supply. And that is what is of utmost priority mm -hmm. to us. Where a certain power plant is sited may not be a matter of priority. We wish the government will in ensuring that they provide stable electricity. That is what we, the citizens, mm -hmm. are expecting. Okay, okay. Let, let, prof, let Prof have you please note it so you can quickly. Prof, take a bite on this issue. Uh, so we're being told that uh, possibly would have uh, more, more, more generation, would have a lower cost, and will have consistency in the supply of power. How does this come to you? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, to be to stay in a neutral position. I think, um, for me, very important thing that we all need to focus on is the idea of sustainable development, okay. right? And we're talking about sustainable development in the, in the context of energy. That also becomes sustainable energy. Mm. Why am I saying this? We need to put out structures, policies in places that can ensure meeting the needs of the present generation mm. without compromising the ability 
uh, of meeting the future generation. And however, I think this government has done a very good job, and the previous government has also done a very good job in putting structures together. But my question is whether sustainable energy or not. Mm. The question becomes, who are the stakeholders? Who are the people responsible? How do we channel the energy resources to promote the well-being of people? Mm. Remember, when we talk about development, for me, the essence of development mm. is to be able to promote the well-being of people. However, well-being can be a contentious mm. uh, term, right? Your well-being might not be my well-being. Mm. And I always tell my students back home in trying to invest in that when I drink palm wine, I feel so good. That is my well-being. You can put me in a huge monumental architectural building, but still, that wouldn't be my well-being. So the starting point of this whole project of car power sh the, to be relocated is let us ask ourselves, what is the impact okay. it's going to be on the people? Mm. Let us ask ourselves, what are the environmental impact? What are the social impact? Mm. Who are the beneficiaries? How would this benefit trick down to our own vulnerable mm. population? Mm. Is there any vulnerability going to uh, come out as a result of this operation? And who are those going to be marginalized? And who are those going to be benefiting? Mm. I believe in the idea of inclusivity. Building a society whereby we all can call a home. Mm -hmm. But a starting point for me is to ask the present government to provide enough education okay. so that people will be better informed about the benefit or thereof of this particular project. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. You had a few so about us quickly. Generally, what we need to understand is that there are three phases when it comes to electricity distribution and production mm -hmm. in any part of the world. The first one is unreliable power, where you don't know where you're going to get power, you don't know when you're going to get power, and you cannot really rely on it. That's a doomso error if you quote mm. it that way. Then we have the second phase, which is reliable power. Reliable power means that, yes, the electricity is largely stable, but there may likely be issues that will come up from time to time. And then there is uninterruptible power. Uninterruptible power is when the lights cannot go off, mm -hmm. no matter what it is that happens. So, for example, if you take a place like New York, over the last decade, you will not have up to 24 hours of light off mm -hmm. that has happened within that period. Now, Ghana has not yet gotten to that period of unreliable, sorry, um, of uninterruptible mm. power supply because we are still building our grid system. We need to have a little bit of excess within the grid so that if a line breaks or a problem happens along mm. the particular route, we can route it to that side. Adam was talking about the fact that yesterday for about 30 minutes or 40 minutes there was a problem. Generally, what that means is that a problem developed in that area, what is called a localized fault. Okay. And you would need to send technicians or engineers to fix that okay. within that period. And mm -hmm. so within 30 to 40 minutes, it is restored, which means that the work was completed within that period and the light came up. That does not take away from the fact that we are in a period of reliable power supply. Mm -hmm. What we need to do, and this will take a lot of investment and take a lot of time, let's say 10, 15 years for Ghana to reach that place. But work, what is heartwarming also mm -hmm. is that work is continuing and we are gradually moving there. We may also have to then take this opportunity to plead with Ghanaians mm. that as we continue to work towards uninterruptible power supply, there may be times where you suffer a little bit of discomfort to enable us do some connections, to enable us move some materials, to enable us move some machines to some areas. If you bear with us, over the period of time that it takes for us to get to uninterruptible power supply, we will get there. Great. Okay, daily graphic. You, you. Yeah, just, just, a, <laughs> just, a, just. A, I think that it's important to state that uh, we are not disputing that we are now in an era of reliable power. But there, there's a widespread power crisis or power cut in most parts of Ghana. It, it happens sometimes. But this reliable power stage where we are today, credit must be given to the John Dramani Mahama government. Today, we are talking about car power. We're talking about a four. 150 megawatts power supply. We're talking about car power ship. Mm. And these are some of the power agreements that the NPP, when they were in opposition, criticized. So it is surprising that today my brother wants us to talk about stable power, wants us to talk about car power ship, and, and, and pretend as if all of these agreements came about. But these the were next procured with state funds? They were procured with state funds, but this was in, this. In a, in a but, situation you, of But you see, you, 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 demonized, you, see, you demonized these power agreements when you were in opposition. Mm -hmm. When you come and you realize that these agreements, this power 
plants that we brought in mm. solved some problem. You ought to eat the humble pie and tell Ghanaians that. I thought we were going to stay nationalistic to on this yes. matter, because, but no, it's because, taking because up all this Thank you, gentlemen. Yes. Daily Graphic this morning says proposed increase in communication tax. Uh, commu uh, consumers to lose talk time value. Telcom's chamber says uh, consumers of telecommunication service uh, will lose about 22% of every one CD talk time they buy due to the proposed increment in the communication service tax. Currently, telephone uh, service consumers such as mobile phone users spend about 19.09 uh, pesos off every uh, one peso, one CD worth of airtime on taxes. The Chamber of Tel uh, Telecommunications has revealed the increment will follow uh, the announcement that was made in, in Parliament. I'll start with you, Prof, on, on this one. Uh, there have been a lot of concerns being raised about this talk tax and that it's a neck breaker. From a social policy point of view, what do you see? Is, is it the best for us? Oh, thank you very much. I think um, for me the starting point is that we all have to understand that we, div we live in an era of globalization. And globalization, I mean those of us in the diaspora always trying to maintain ties of mm. our homeland. And I always say, we live here, but also there. The question becomes, how do we live here and there? Living here and there all amount to the idea of telecommunication. Okay. We shouldn't forget mm. about the fact that now time and space have been brought together mm. because of all this globalization, telecommunication, advanced technology. Mm. So anything that has to do with people getting an opportunity to be able to interact, to engage mm. in a meaningful way should be encouraged. And uh, unfortunately, this talk time in the Canadian context, Canadians have also been crying about the fact that there are few giant industry service mm. providers mm. like the Rogers, Bear Canada, that have been, you know, taking advantage, monopolizing the market. Okay. What I want to suggest is that governments should create opportunity mm. for more flexible competition so that mm. we invite other service providers into the system to be able to compete so that the existing um, stakeholders should be able to provide telecommunication situation to people here in efficiency. You're talking about the ideal yeah. situation, yeah. but this announcement was met with mixed reactions. So people say, look, this cost is too burdensome. And then on the reverse, some are saying, it will afford government an opportunity to draw more people into the tax net and relieve you know, those who are high up there, you know, a bit, so that those who are low down there could also be contributing to the national coffers. What do you say? Well, I mean, let us begin to, for me, I, looking at the impact any policy should have, how it affects the people, mm. right? The people are the consumers. And the question becomes, were they even invited to the table to be part of, you know, the consultation, discussion? Mm. And, you know, airing the views, for example, I went to Achimata, Okay. School, and I found that we have vibrant youth, people who are ready to offer. Do we consult with them? Do we find out from them mm. what are their views and what can they also provide? Mm. I think that should be the starting point. Okay, great. Now, now the telcos chamber say uh, government should be cautious about overtaxing the telcos industry because it will not augur well for them. Prof, it's just been talking about expansion of infrastructure to allow us all connectivity. And the telcos say, look, if you keep breaking our backs like that. We can't do what the people expect, and eventually they say we are shambolic. Uh, will government listen? Thank you very much, but I cannot let this go by, so I have to respond to that more. Listen, let us not seek mm, to place individuals above the national interest. If something has been done and we are trying to deal with it, mm. seeking to place one individual on a certain pedestal because of political interest will not help anybody. Today, you want us to go about and be proclaiming John Mahama as the savior in this country. To determine whether Doomsaw was solved or not, what you need is an energy commission report on a yearly basis. Mm. That tells you that this is the number of hours that we suffered load shedding in every given year. Mm. If you look at that energy report, and Hughes, I would not state anything. I'm mm. just giving you a lead. Mm. And I would want you to help your, 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 your viewers by going to look for those reports. I can provide them to you if you want. 2016, you'd realize that we had over 400 hours mm. of load shedding in this country. Mm. If you come to 2017, what you realize is that we had less than 100 hours 
of load shedding in this country. That gives you a clear picture of who solved the crisis in this country. Secondly, look, if you want us to talk about the contracts that we are dealing with, mm. that is why we have excess capacity challenges in this country. Okay. May no, I, may I, may I, you, may you, I finish? You may it's I finish? okay. I can't add them too, so it's only no, fair. No, but that it's my time. You, are, so no, you have made your time. <laughs> no, no, but it's yeah, not my time. It's your time, unless, but the viewer is following a conversation I agree with you. talk tax. Just, just one so more thing. I beg thing. you, please. Just, let, just let, one I'm, more thing. I'm asking the question, the fact that the Telcos Chamber, Kenneth Shigbe, said that if you continue to tax the Telcos too hard, uh, industry specific taxes, it will not augur well for them because then it will not give them the latitude to be able to expand. Hughes, properly. may I plead with you? No, One please. more statement. No, not that more, please. Oh, Hughes, Thank it's you. very important Thank that your you viewers right. find that. I'll about give this. you a chance to wrap up at the end. You can talk about okay. energy. If you now, you see, it. this government clearly, I believe, has done some consultation before the CSD was rolled mm. out. The second thing you need to understand is that all these views and opinions are collated. So, if you, if you deal in the public sector, what mm. you understand is that when you want to roll out a, a policy, you just first of all need to identify the problem that you want to address. Okay. Then based on the problem that you want to address, you do your, you do your, you know, your, you sit with your technical staff and come up with an understanding mm. of what the possible solutions are. And based on the possible solutions, you go out and engage stakeholders. Mm. And you get their feedback that, well, if you do this, it's going to affect us in this way. And after you've done all of these stakeholder consultations, mm. you come back in-house with your technical staff okay. and arrange a policy that tells you that this is how we are going to definitively deal with it. Mm. And then you go back again to consult with them. Mm. You are not likely to have everybody agree with you. But then you have to, at a point, make a decision and they, roll they it They say out. they're already paying 40% in may. taxes and levies as if companies. I may. <laughs> and you're adding this. You're if I may. Them. So when that is done mm. and the policy is rolled out, then you continue to engage and get feedback from these stakeholders. Mm. And you make the necessary changes as, as we proceed. So, for example, the luxury vehicle tax, for example, was a policy that was rolled out by this government. Mm. We continued the engagement after it was done. And we realized that it wasn't, first of all, given us the results that we wanted mm. and also it was creating an unnecessary problem for those that were supposed to be engaging so what did mm. the government do the government decided that we need to scrap this policy because it does not bring in the necessary result i believe that the mm. chamber will, has always known that this mechanism exists and so as it has been rolled out we continue to engage with them and as and as we go through the system clearly clearly mm. if there are any challenges therein you'll find out that government will Mm -hmm. take it up and address it as we move forward. That's the only way we can continue to move as a country. I can understand their concerns that they are being taxed heavily. Mm -hmm. But you see, one of the fundamental things is that I am also aware that they came out earlier on to say that this is mm -hmm. not a cost that they as companies are going to bear mm -hmm. and that they are going to pass it on to the end users. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit not so mm -hmm. sure. If that is exactly the position, then mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. come? they are now complaining that they themselves are being taxed because this is not a tax <laughs> that is incidental on them as, mm. as a final end users. So if that be the case, mm. yes, government is also mindful okay. of the fact that telecommunication and the benefits that it comes with it also helps in the developmental efforts of this country. For example, with the advent of WhatsApp and all of these mm -hmm. things, it enables information sharing at a very fast pace. I mean, yeah. I regret that during my days in the university, for example, oh, it wasn't WhatsApp. possible <laughs> to get <laughs> WhatsApp because, you know, we, it would have been very easy to SMS, share notes SMS. and find all of those things. So, I mean, we used to spend quite a large amount of money mm -hmm. on photocopy, among yeah. other things, which could have been eliminated therein. So government is mindful of all of these things. But it is also one of the easiest ways to broaden the tax net. Remember, we are not just dealing with taxing the already available mechanisms. We've put in place other mechanisms that we are continuing to grow. Ghana is a developing country. Mm. Over 60 years, we've gotten here. But when you realize that we've done the digital addressing system, and you realize that we are doing the national ID card, and you realize that we are trying to harmonize our, our identification system such that we can know definitively mm. who is a Ghanaian, who is not a Ghanaian, who is resident in this country at this moment, is that, is who is that, not is resident. Is that enough justification to over milk the telcos? I, I don't think, so. let, let's, let's be clear, that mm. I don't think that the telcos are over milked in court. Mm. Now, moving forward, I do not also want to be seen to be saying that government, this is government's position. What I'm saying is government has a process of continuous engagement. Okay. And within that mechanism, we can continue okay. to correct whatever else but, there but, are. But, but what is best practice? Is it to have everybody around the table and have, you know, majority agree to it than to push the policy signed onto it, implemented, people complain. Because we saw it in the luxury ta vehicle tax. 
you saw that. What I mean, you need everybody to Everybody complained. Gabe went ahead to implement. Uh, less than a year, we pulled it out. What you need to understand is that when it comes to the process of governance and public administration, you are never going to have that point where everybody agrees on something unilaterally. It won't happen. So you do your engagement. I'm saying majority. I didn't say everybody. What, how do you determine what is majority? Well, if you have 10 people by the table who will form a quorum, if you have seven I'm or not six sure of that, them, I'm not sure that you're suggesting. Yeah. I'm not sure that you're suggesting that at any particular table, majority was the case. What I'm, however, saying okay. is that the clarity that needs to be brought is that when mm. it gets to that process of stakeholder engagement, at a point, you will have to make a decision okay. and move on. But even after mm. the decision has been made, mm. the critical element, which is the continuous engagement for feedback from your critical mm. stakeholders, mm. is what is necessary. All of these publications that are coming up are part of the stakeholder process. This, for example, is not necessarily aimed at government, but at influencing discussions like this that we are having this morning, bringing their issues to the fore. I'm very sure that the Ministry of Communication took into consideration all the necessary ambits before they did this. It is, it is very instructive to also note mm. that there's a process of continuous engagement. So in the end, we will continue to align and harmonize all of mm. these things to ensure that the Ghanaian is the ultimate beneficiary. But it is also important to note that this is not the only mechanism for, for, for even taxing Ghanaians. Government has realized that there's a problem generally in widening the tax okay. net. And we are taking other steps, which may take some time to materialize, but other mm. steps like uh, what I've mentioned so far, to ensure that we have accurate data which will enable us, first of all, make the necessary interventions okay. to ensure that the development Let's allow of this country to have a bite as well. Adam, last year, the talk tax generated some 420 million Ghana cities. And well, Oliver Twist, the government, wants some more to, to do one or two things. But the telcos say, look, you're, you're pressing us too hard. What do you say? Are they being pressed too hard from what you said? I, th I think that this uh, issue about the communication service tax. Um, it's, it's a very important issue that we must all delve in and understand the, the nitty gritties mm -hmm. of it. And if I were a policy uh, analyst sitting somewhere listening to my brother who speaks for the government and, and, and he makes certain uh, assertions such as that when this is an, a continuous engagement, so they will continue engaging the various stakeholders. Mm -hmm and as and when they pick relevant feedback, they will decide to take some necessary action. I think it is important to understand that every policy decision continues to be, a, I mean, an interactive process. You continue to engage. However, a matter as important as taxes is one that government ought not to get its projections wrong. Mm. When they were introducing the luxury vehicle taxes, mm. the levy, the NDC raised concerns Many other tax experts raised concerns about the target group and that government was never going to meet their target when it comes to the amount that they were expected to raise from that. In fact, dealers in vehicles complained that it was going to affect their business. Mm. But of course, the know-it-all government that doesn't listen to anybody decided to ignore all of the concerns that Ghanaians raised. Mm. In less than a year, they went in, it hit back at their faces, and then they came back and they withdrew. After withdrawing, they decided to find other alternative means of imposing taxes on Ghanaians. And then they increased the CST. You want to ask yourself why the CST is a convenient vehicle for them to raise more money. The CST has been there for that 10 years. It's so. been there from 2008. It right. was actually actu uh, introduced in 2008. But why are they increasing it? Because they realized that penetration rate of the mobile phone use in Ghana mm. is about 119%. We have 35 million. We, are, we have use. about 35 million subscribers, even though our population is about, because some of us have yes, multiple phones. Mm. So we have 35 million subscribers of mobile. So it, it tells you that if you are a government that you, you are not innovative and you want to raise taxes, the most convenient means is to look at this wide Back it. But at the end of the day, what, what alternative who, is there? You what what, what, is what, what all, alternative is there? You see, innovative. when you see sometimes when we are talking about taxes, and 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 we make some uh, pronouncements, it's important to also refer to the pronouncements that the government made when they were in opposition. This is a government. This but, is but a, if, you, if you make no, reference it's to past pronouncements, how no, does that solve the present problem? No, it solves a, it solves a, because we need to let the citizens understand where we are. We must accept first where we are, then we can decide where we want to get to. 
Now, I'll, I'll give you just a number of examples. One, this is a government that rode to power on the back of reducing taxes or removing what they call or they claim nuisance taxes. Mm. And when you look at the explanation for the nuisance taxes, they refer to such taxes that they thought was a burden on the ordinary citizen. Mm. Now, when you look at this CST that they have increased, we are going to pay more. And who are the most vulnerable? When you go to even our rural areas, these are the people that are using mobile phones. They call, they will call their children even in Accra and all Does of that. that so you are vulnerable. increasing. No, they, because at the end of the day, you, you, you are looking at if you want to increase that, if you want to increase your taxes, mm -hmm. you must in, introduce taxes that does not burden <coughs> the already vulnerable or the underprivileged people. And you look at the fact that when you look at who are the people that are using mobile phones, it is not just a certain elite class and all of that. Because when they were introducing the luxury vehicle tax last year, their explanation was that they needed to tax those who have excess income. But you look at the fact that now you took that out and you are reversed back to increasing the CST, which affects which people? Everybody, including the most vulnerable people. So, so you had a problem so, with the luxury vehicle tax. You have a problem with the CST. I'm asking you, what alternative is there? The alternative is <coughs> that there are leakages in the system in, in terms of um, tax revenue collection. This government has never been able to meet its revenue target. We ought to look at how we address all of that. When we decided to introduce this digitized means of taking taxes and I mean even this paperless and all right. of that. The expectation was that it was going to contribute to increasing government revenue. And they so did. let's it let's did. let's let's why why are we still not being able to meet our revenue target? These are the yeah, issues so that we ought to let's look at how we can formalize most of our businesses that are in the informal sector and let them pay taxes. Because as we speak, only a few people are paying taxes. How do we get the GRA and, and other stakeholders mm. to ensure that okay. we, we get a lot of people into the tax and without increasing because those who are already paying tax are the people that are using the mobile phones. So you don't increase the people who are already paying. Rather, increase, I mean, get more people into the tax net. And that is the, 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 the approach that government must take <coughs> instead of overburdening those of us who are already paying taxes Prof. through our, 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 our phone 27% of us are taking care of 73 uh, percent of the population. That's according to the uh, the population office That's here. Unfortunate in, dependency well, ratio. Exactly the dependency ratio. Now, Adam is complaining now about the government trying to rope in everybody to contribute key to a How is it done in Canada? What can we learn from from best practice? Well, every government, whether in the developed world or in the global south, try to generate revenue mm. uh, for meaningful uh, and effective development projects. Whatever you do it also depends on a particular government political ideology, mm. right? Sometimes ideology like social democracy, liberalism, conservatism, inform your, the way you even adopt physical policies in you know, harnessing this revenue. But for here, I mean, uh, listening to you saying that 27% mm. of population taking care of 73% mm. is to suggest that there's high dependency ratio. Mm. And that's what we have to look at, right? But I would like to advise my young politicians up and coming that because you are the future, you are the agents of change. I mean, we shouldn't try to politicize every issue that comes on the table. What we have to look at, it, we have to look at the situation right on the face. We look at what are the uh, primary objectives? Who are we trying to address? Who are we trying to salvage here? Is that Ghanaian population? And who are the vulnerable? And who are the marginalized? So having this, therefore, I mean, for example, the NDC was in power, meaning that you have some kind of experience, mm. no matter what. You've been in office for about eight years, right? And so with MPP coming in over, there's that mutual thing that you can learn from each other. It's sort of politicizing event. And over here, sometimes my brother in Ghana, I've been listening to political news, and every little policy, tiny situation is politicized. Mm. And that is what we need to, 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 to look at. We need to stay away from mm. situations like this. So coming back to the question of revenue generation, we look, have to look at our task. And then, I think for me, the essence is putting down systems in place. Mm. Right now, you cannot go around in the country collecting taxes from who and from what we need to do 
a lot of work in terms of coming out of research. What is the, the, the government says is just doing the uh, digital addressing system, the national ID to to help to identify. Now, that could be a starting way. point of putting systems in place. We don't have these systems. You go back and forth. You run. It's like somebody using a trial and error method. You go and hit the one and you come back. Meanwhile, you've spent and wasted taxpayers' money. So for me, the most important thing is putting systems in place, like Joe Cody in Ghana card. Mm. In Ghana, for example, I have my driver's license. Anytime I, where I go, it's identify who I am, okay. where I work. And so the government is able to demographically profile everybody in every neighborhood, in every census mm. tract. Mm. for the purpose of revenue generation. And I'm coming back to uh, the ruling government right now. I think your job is to be able to educate mm. people about your good intentions. I'm sure you have good intentions, but if the people don't even understand what you are doing, then it becomes problematic. Mm. Like your op political opponent will then score points from you. <laughs> so your point is to be able to educate people for them to understand that, hey, we came to inherit a system mm. which is on this left or right side. But our job is this what we are doing from the beginning. Begin to educate the people, make them more informative, try to illustrate your points and ideas for them okay. so that they will understand what the government Prof, is doing. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, okay, yes. Yes. If, if I can. Prof, Prof, says, uh, I, 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 share, I share with you, I share your concerns very much, and I believe that that is what as government we are trying to do. This morning, you realize that we have I've tried as much as possible to go into the issue. So after dealing with the communication service stacks, I've tried to identify that this is, yes, this is a measure that has been taken now. But moving forward, we acknowledge the fact that we need to build systems like you have identified. That will give us more credible data, mm -hmm. which will make our plan more effective and solve the problems that we have in this country. The only problem that we have in this country also is that due to the over politicization, which you have clearly identified, there is this effort where any time that government is going out to explain to people, you will find that the political opposition would also come up with very interesting concepts, trying to confuse the people and creating counter narratives, which is just meant to ensure that the people do not we, see. We've done that since 1992. The, I'm, I'm just saying. And that, that is really yeah, And that is what, may, I, may, I, may, I, may I finish? <laughs> so that counter narrative is what is supposed to confuse the people and points to an evil that does not exist. For example, on this morning's program, we've been told that the CST is bad. Increasing CST from 6 to 9% is a very bad measure and that we are imposing taxes that affect the marginal among others. You impose taxes on mach mach machetes. You impose taxes on condoms. Okay, so I'm you, sure you, you didn't listen to Prof. <laughs> Prof spoke to you about not politicizing, and here we are. I'm but, just saying. But Harold Lasso, the record. Harold Lasso <laughs> says politics is who gets what, when, and how. He didn't say why. I'm sure you're finding out why now. Let's move on. Page 16 of the Daily Graphic says there were irregularities in school feeding program, according to the Audit General's report. And I, I find this um, interesting because uh, we all know the place of education, and I was talking about inclusive education and we made a pledge to ourselves to feed our youngsters. Now, the 2018 Auditor General's report has revealed several financial irregularities that have led to huge financial losses to the state in the running of the Ghana School Feeding Program with 81 metropolitan municipal and district assemblies um, across the country. And uh, it says bloated enrollment figures, duplication of schools and payment of grants to non-existent caterers in the 2017-2018 year as well as under declaration of revenue from sale of application forms according to the report account for huge losses running into millions of cities this, this is what we have from our start with you uh, in a country and again because you're a social policy expert in a country where we we hope to reach everybody and spread everywhere and encourage children to be in school and to stay healthy to be able to acquire knowledge here we are people are duplicating the existence of schools faking documents just to rip the state off in the meantime there are other communities that have not even had a teaspoon of honey or sugar you know as part of the school feeding program how does this come to you especially coming from a canadian perspective where uh, we say we're doing A to B and it is done just the way it is. Thank you very much. This is a very interesting concept, the school feeding program. The first time I heard about this, was I, as I told myself, my wife and my children were just, wow, this is Ghana. I mean, this is a, an attempt by a government trying to meet the welfare of the people. Mm. These are some examples of laudable policies that speak to promoting the well-being of 
of, of people. Uh, initially, I told mm. that social policy is nothing about public policies mm. that are intended to address the well-being of people. And so l let us look at the intention of this school feeding program. Mm. I think the original intention is that whoever started it, right, mm. is to promise... His Excellency Kufo. Well, mm. uh, and, and again, we shouldn't politicize anything. No, it's not. I mean, that's the fact. That's okay. the fact. That's the fact. So, I mean, I think the intention is to, uh, to promote the well-being of these children who become the future leaders of a country. And mm. I think it's a very laudable. The question becomes, how do we do it effectively? and efficiently. Where do we get enough resources to continue, and again, in the spirit of the present government, sustainable development? You start a policy, how do you assess whether a policy is good or bad? And some of these irregularities that you are talking mm. about will come out to, to, to ascertain whether the policy is good or bad. Mm. Any good policy should have this basic criteria. It should be accessible. Okay. Many children in the country, throughout the country, should be able to access that school feeding program. Mm -hmm. Number two, it has to be uh, inclusive. Mm -hmm. When I talk about inclusiveness, that means every child in the mm -hmm. corner of the country should be included in this particular program. If the program is only targeting a group of people or a segment of the Ghanaian population, then that program is not mm -hmm. a good policy mm -hmm. program. The other one is also to look at how sustainable mm. that policy becomes, especially the school feeding program. Sometimes I ask myself, uh, is the government going to continue to do that? And if it's able to do that, mm. then I'll give that particular government credit. The mm. question is that there should be a chain of reaction that even if MPP started it, after MPP is in the office, the, 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 the next government mm. should look at the strength the opportunities from this program and build upon that. It's been sustained, I must yeah, say. Since, uh, exactly. So if it is being sustained through various levels of government, then I, 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 I would say it is good. The, the, the sustenance is there, but it isn't growing. And it isn't growing because now we're being told uh, by the Auditor General's report that mm -hmm. schools are now being manufactured on paper to be able to assess funds meant for the, uh, the school feeding program. So... We have more than 200 districts in this country. Only 81 are benefiting. We could have increased the number from 81 to say 100. But somebody somewhere is manufacturing documents to represent a school to cash in on this. And that is really bad. That is where uh, in policies you have to try to block all the loopholes for that we're saying, right? So if a, we have a system like this, which is very laudable, and somebody is taking advantage mm. of the loopholes in the system, then I think the government job is to be able to identify those loopholes and block it. Okay. And then that, yeah. Now, now, what's government's response to, to this one, 2017-2018 uh, academic year? It's, it's right under your purview. Will it be another season of go and sin no more, or people will be brought to book? I do not think so. And you may, uh, you may want to avert your mind to the fact that the Auditor General has recently taken up his powers over disallowance and surcharge very seriously. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, continuing to allow us to recoup some of these monies that ordinarily would have been lost mm -hmm. in, in, in the system. What is critical also is that we need to understand that, you see, these are some of the measures that we, we take to self-sabotage mm -hmm. in this country. You know, I do not believe that anybody would get up and say that that sabotage that is being conducted at, that le at the level of the <coughs> districts among others is the president or is a minister that will go down to that level mm -hmm. to go and ensure that these things are being done. It is you and I, the ordinary citizens of this country, who are trying as hard as possible to ensure that we pull down our own selves. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we need to address within, first of all, ourselves. There is this culture where, you know, uh, we seem to have internalized this mechanism of the end justifies the means. So mm -hmm. if you're able to do it and you don't get caught, mm -hmm. then that is that. It tells in our churches, it tells in the various parts mm -hmm. that we have. So people gain wealth and then they throw it about and then with the advent of social media and all of these things. This is all part of the socialization mm -hmm. that we have in this country. My plea is that we should understand that our actions have effect. Mm -hmm. As Hughes, you've clearly identified, if my actions aimed at getting more funds illegally for myself is resulting in others who genuinely have a need being denied of what they need, then I must understand that I am an evil person. Mm -hmm. I sh it shouldn't take a pastor, it shouldn't take anybody to come and tell me that I am an evil person. The critical thing is that it is very easy 
and very often due to the tenor of our political conversations we tend to say oh this is a political thing and it is politicians that must be blamed and so the real actors of these things walk away with their prof, prof is talking about assessment of the policy and then implementation of same critically least, i mean and i don't remember we have done auditor any, general, I'm coming. any critical assessment what we also need how what we also need to give credit for is that even this auditor general's reports that are identified these things is part of the methods of assessment of this policy mm. for example we spent x amount of money was the money put to good use mm. is the money being applied judiciously are we using the proper mechanisms mm. for the discharge the, the, of the these auditor funds? general will release the report every year but may we I? will go back to the same things may so I? then what will be the essence of that uh if you like vetting process and, and what audit. i've told you is that remember that in recent years and particularly from 2017 coming the powers of uh, disallowance and search have mm -hmm. taken quite a great uh, leap in, in this country where more and more people uh, when you make an expenditure and it is done illegally and the auditor general identifies it he will disallow it and surcharge you with it which mm -hmm. means that whatever amount of money that has been taken or has been lost due to your action you have to refund back that back to the state critical point is that this is all part of a method of assessment and review mm. where the funds judiciously used where are they, is it getting the necessary impact for example so no we realize that these actions of these people is creating a problem for us as a result of that how do we address it the policy makers then armed with this information will sit back review the information how are we doing procurement for instance in these mechanisms how are targeted schools identified mm. and again remember that as part of this uh national identification effort for example we would know who is where and so if you present schools for example and you say that the children within this district are fifteen thousand, when the database tells us clearly that they are nowhere near seven thousand, mm. immediately with an integration of these systems it will highlight it and give us a red flag but, but no, that in, in, in an also distant uh, past we've been we've been told how uh, political party actors and in fact at some point uh, female organizers and male organizers were the ones who were identifying who will be cooking for the schools, and whether they had the capacity that's to exactly, or not. That's exactly the problem that I'm coming to, which is we always situate these things within a political sphere. Mm. And you allow the individuals to walk away because once you begin... But, but you may see, I, Nana, Nana, Hughes, Nana, if you Nana, allow me... I'm not, I'm if, not situa I'm not if you allow me... It, hold on. I'm not situating it within a political context. I'm saying that the, the, the school feeding program is run from the perspective of a local assembly. <clears throat> now, the local assembly has a structure. There's an officer at the office who's supposed to be ensuring that the process runs well. How then does the political actor come in to now pinpoint Madam A, Madam B, Madam C is the one going to cook the food, even if they don't have the can, capacity, the funding, the well without the experience. These are these are allegations. Why? Hold on, these they, are, they allegations. are not allegations. We've what seen them. How? We've seen them in the past. How did you see them in the past? They, they are not. What, no, I'm saying, how did you see them in the past? Because you see, exactly what I'm speaking about is what what is being done here, and I'll I'll tell you, I am an individual first mm. before I speak for a political party or before I do anything. So if my actions lead to loss. To the state that attempt to then relate it to a political party takes it beyond me are you downplaying may the, I, the, may are you downplaying I, the, if you allow me to no, finish no, hold on. no see, i have a problem with see, this because no, no, i haven't been allowed no, to make my point no, no, so if you'd allow no, no, me you're speaking I, no, I, no 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 he's on no, no, this particular issue no, no, relax. you just asked me no, a question no, that i am trying to address no, no, relax for me but if you allow me to address no, no, the relax question for me i agree that we are all individuals and we should be dealt with individually if we offend the law I am saying that does that take away the part the party plays where you have party functionaries call on and we, we would make reference to Bugri, Bugri Nabu and, mm -hmm. and Utiko Jabba mm -hmm. in, in the matter of school mm -hmm. feeding program. It mm -hmm. was a big issue. Mm -hmm. Now, even though you'd want to mention individuals, you'd also don't want to take over the uh, or Water see, down so unfortunately, I can I can hear the the background music mm. being played, which means that we run out of yes, time. But but you see, the me. challenge is that I haven't therefore been able to give you the explanation that you were asking for, mm. and that becomes a challenge because these issues remain unaddressed. Mm. What I would say specifically mm. is that listen, once you begin to elevate matters of individual action and seek to associate them with political parties, mm. you are then given cover for the individuals to walk away under the guise of political parties because guess what okay. what adam is going to do here is seek to say you that you don't know what he but allow me to finish allow me to finish what adam is going to i'm coming and I, 
Mark me if I'll be wrong. Okay, okay. What Adam is going to do mm. is to seek to situate this within a political sphere okay. and say that this is the action of a political party and it is leading to all of that. Darren, Darren, <laughs> I am not sure <laughs> that the president sitting where he is or the minister sitting mm. where they are are actively going out there saying that this should be an avenue for political corruption. Okay. But thank you. When Huge. you put it in that sphere, Johnny, thank you. Political parties then will play along we'll and seek to score time. cheap political points. Okay, great. Uh, Adam, take a bite on this. This Johnny, is what Johnny, we have. I, Dr. I Dr. That, Dr. Yes. Siaidu, uh, who was the coordinator at the time, had been asked to step aside in 2018. But somebody says it doesn't solve the problem of the leakages and irregularities. What do you say? Johnny, I can understand why my brother Nana Damwa is trying to take all my time. And, and, and also try to situate the, con the, the conversation for me. First, we need to establish that whatever is happening, we cannot delink it from political party activists. We what cannot. No, it's no, you see. Go he's ahead. Nana, Nana, no, Nana, you see. No, I'm just asking. Johnny, and, and Johnny, 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 in mm. 2009, <laughs> when the NDC <laughs> took over from the present Kufo administration, there were about 4, 440,000 basic school children that were benefiting from the school feeding right within the eight years by 2016 the ndc government increased or expanded the program to cover 1.6 million basic school children and there were political players huge, as well and what huge, happened to the hold on for me let me do my huge, 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 nana, let me do my it's job a nana, 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 Adam, nana, and there were political it's a question it's a question it's a question when you were it's a question it's a question it's a question it's a question no you need to allow it's a question you were misinforming the allowed you were misinforming the he allowed you we're run out of time i understand this is the strategy by Adam. Adam. so i'm saying that there was increase yes but there were political actors as well as we saw there may be political actors at no, the time. No, but, there may be. no, but no, Johnny, you need to. But okay. at the end of the day, have we been able to establish that within that period, the quality of food, these irregularities that we are talking about, mm. did the auditors general establish that within that period? Right. Yes. No. We are speaking yes. to an audit report. Please. An audit report which indicts you 2017, 2018. I'm just saying. In February 2019, just this year, Yellow Crobo. When the MCE removed the school feeding caterers, those who had a contract from mm. office, the NPP executives in that constituency demonstrated against the MCE because the NPP has effectively made the school feeding program a political reward scheme for their women organizers. Ma minus the NDC. And I am challenging minus, minus you, the NDC. you can go look at how contracts were awarded under the NDC. As I'm speaking to you, in almost every district, this school feeding program is being handled by women organizers of the NPP. So they see it as a political reward scheme. And that is why they are effectively engaging in all these corrupt acts and irregularities. Where do we Ma go from here? Johnny, where do we Johnny, go from here? Not long ago, mm. where on do social we go media, from here? I'm, I'm making a reference. Mm. Not long ago on social media, I watched a video of the kind of food that is served to our junior brothers and sisters, and I wept. The quality. You see that, let's say on Wednesday, they're supposed to be served beans. And you see, just a lot of water with just about two or three grains of beans in it. These videos are still available on social media. You okay. can go watch Thank it. Thank you very the much. The NPP has made this a political reward scheme. Thank you. And they must take responsibility. Thank you. I will not much. be surprised if all of them go unpunished. Mm -hmm. Because, like what, I'm saying, then what is our political party Nanda Mwa, uh, uh, speaks for no, no, the NPP. Adam Abana is also the deputy uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the the youth organizer of the NDC. Doc, thank you very much. I saw you shaking your head. You are you are disappointed oh, that Johnny, it's Johnny, been politicized. Johnny, 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 and as opponents, mm -hmm. your job is to be able to convince the other that this is my policies, this is the deliverables, and now stay with me or you don't stay with me. Okay. I mean, you cannot that's, base that's on the okay. based on facts. Thank, thank you very much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, Professor but, but, David Ferrell is Johnny, from just, the Trade University in Canada. Isn't it uh, not surprising you. that all of a sudden, Nana Damwa is saying that. Leonardo cannot Johnny, come from the top to say after the break. What did I say? Johnny? When Jida and others came, it was President Mahama that went to the business.